thank you, uh, thank you all for uh, for attending uh, this uh, um, event today, this public lecture by by Matthew Jackson. Matthew Jackson is professor of economics at Stanford University, and is the recipient of the Jean-Jacques Lafont Prize 2020. So we are very happy and honored to, uh, that uh, Matthew Jackson has accepted this prize in memory of Jean-Jacques Lafont. Uh, Colette Lafont, uh, Jean-Jacques' spouse, and some of uh, his uh, relatives are with us today, and 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 we are very glad to be able to perpetuate the memory of Jean-Jacques with them in the context of this prize. The Jean-Jacques Lafont Prize was created in 2005, in 2005, by the Toulouse School of Economics in partnership with the city of Toulouse. It is awarded annually and rewards a high-level international economist whose scientific work is in the spirit of Jean-Jacques Lafont's work, um, meaning it offers fundamental insights and is rooted in important real world economic and social issues. Um, I would like to thank all the people who at TSC and at the town hall have made this event possible. There are a lot of people, but uh, let me mention Stéphanie Risser and Florence Chauvet who have provided a wonderful administrative support. And this was not easy uh, as you imagine, given the, the many adaptations uh, they had to work on due to the health uh, situation. And I would also like to thank professors Karin van der Straten and Michel Le Breton, who have taken very great care of the scientific organization of this prize. So the public lecture of Matthew Jackson will be followed by, the, by a prize ceremony that will be in French in presence of Mr. Maxime Boyer, who is deputy uh, of the Toulouse mayor, Jean-Luc Moudinck. Uh, before leaving the floor to Karin van der Straten, who will uh, uh, present Matthew Jackson, please let me congratulate you, Matthew, as laureate of the, of the Jean-Jacques Lafont Prize 2020. And let me thank you very much for your availability, your kindness that uh, greatly facilitated the organization of this event. And again, thank you very much for presenting us uh, your uh, fascinating work on the dynamics of uh, social networks and, and their economic consequences. Thank you very much. Karin, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Sebastian. Um, it, uh, it has been a pleasure to, to prepare this short introduction together with my uh, colleague, uh, Michel Le Breton, uh, who happens to, uh, to know Matt well, uh, has known Matt for, for a long time since our even co-authors on some work in, in political economy. Um, so it has been a pleasure, but I must say that uh, presenting uh, Matthew is also a, a very intimidating task uh, because uh, his list of uh, scientific contributions and, and honors is, uh, is just uh, extremely impressive. Um, so maybe let's start with a few biographical uh, facts. So as you said, Sebastian, uh, Matthew Jackson is professor of economics at Stanford University. Um, he received his BA from Princeton and his PhD from uh, Stanford. He spent the first 10 years also of his career at uh, Northwestern, the following 10 at Caltech and uh, join, before joining Stanford some 15 years ago. Um, his list of uh, honors is uh, already very long. Is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, of the Econometric Society, of the Game Theory Society, um, and, the, and the list is long. He has already uh, received several awards, among which the John von Neumann Award and the Arrow Prize uh, for uh, Senior Economists. But uh, so today we're here uh, for the, the prize in, uh, in the honor of uh, Jean-Jacques Lafont. Uh, and uh, so Sebastian uh, uh, reminded us of, of the prize. And uh, Mathieu is really an, uh, an ideal uh, recipient for, for, for this prize, uh, which is a, a tribute to economists whose uh, research uh, much in the spirit of the works undertaken by Jean-Jacques Lafont, uh, combine theory and empirics to, to address important economic and, uh, and social uh, questions. And obviously, Matthew Jackson excels uh, at this. Um, maybe one first thing that is particularly striking when contemplating his, uh, his scientific output 
is that, as Jean-Jacques Lafont, uh, is certainly not the scholar of a single field. His work spans many different uh, areas with actually a strong overlap with some of Jean-Jacques uh, Lafont's own scientific interests. So just to mention a few, uh, game theory, implementation, markets, uh, auctions, political economy, and uh, network economics. So this last topic, so the study of uh, economic and social uh, networks has perhaps become uh, over the years the most important uh, topic in his research agenda with uh, applications to, to questions as diverse as uh, international trade, uh, military coalition, disease control, microfinance, labor, as we saw an example in the, in the seminar uh, Matt gave last uh, Monday. Uh, but uh, also uh, legislative activities, uh, economic development, and, and it will actually be the subject of, uh, of today's lecture. Um, another distinctive feature, uh, I would say, is that um, as much as in the case of uh, Jean-Jacques Lafont, theory occupies a, a very central place in Matt's uh, approach to the social sciences. In a recent paper entitled, uh, I mean, The Road of Theory in an Age of Design and Big Data, uh, Matt asks the following question, and I quote, with the growing availability of large and detailed data sets and the improvement in the computing technology and methodology to mine and analyze those data, is economic theory uh, doomed to extinction? And he adds, one can find those who claim that the data will do all the speaking and that theory will uh, become obsolete. So obviously, uh, Matt uh, doesn't seem to side uh, with his people and uh, he makes in this article a very convincing argument for a use of a combination of uh, theory, uh, empirics and experimentation. Um, an argument that he actually uh, put into practice in his own works. Uh, some of these uh, being uh, done with a number of, uh, well, with a set of impressive courses. Um, so using uh, various uh, tools like uh, structural econometrics, uh, a tradition which is uh, also represented at the, at the tools called economics, but also using uh, field experiments as for example in the recent um, series of work in development economics with uh, Abhijit Banerjee and the study flow uh, inter alia. Um, so to, to, to conclude, um, I think I, I would like to strongly encourage you to visit uh, Matthew's website, uh, not only to get access and, uh, and to read the, I think over 150 uh, academic articles and, and books uh, he wrote, but also because you can find there a, a wealth of information on the list of uh, very eclectic topics. Uh, I found a video uh, explaining to school children why uh, game theory is fun and important. Uh, you can find tips to prepare for a talk. Uh, you can find instructions uh, for cycling in uh, Swaziland. Uh, well, not that it was useful to me, but uh, we've uh, also learned with when preparing with. Uh, introduction with, uh, with Michelle. Um, so Michelle has been in contact with uh, Matt's wife, uh, Sarah, and he learned from her that um, Matthew at some point was uh, number five in the Californian mountain biker ranking, if, uh, if we got our information uh, right. So, uh, so, that's, uh, so that, that's, uh, that, that's very impressive. Not only has the academy uh, uh, so impressive that Matthew is also an, uh, an accomplished athlete. So um, I think with that, I will, I will stop the, the introduction, just uh, a few words about uh, the format for today. So this uh, public lecture will uh, last until 6.30 uh, p.m. Then there will be the ceremony award in, uh, in French. Um, so uh, there are many people uh, in the room uh, the microphones in, in the audience will be uh, kept uh, switched off and we will 
keep the, the questions uh, for the end. So the, there will be no question during the talk, but the Q&A uh, session at, uh, at the end. Uh, but you can start asking uh, questions in the, in the chat if you have some, and uh, Sebastian and I will, will keep track. And at the end, uh, when we'll open the floor for, for session, we will give a priority to, to questions that have been asked in, uh, in the chat. Okay, so uh, I think that we, 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 we can start now. So Matthew, the, the floor is yours. We are very happy and uh, honored to, to have you today. Well, th thank you very much for that kind introduction, Karine, and uh, Sebastian, and, and also Michel behind the scenes, and all of the... It's, it's wonderful to see the family Lapon here. And let me just say a couple of words. I think, you know, the, uh, the first time I visited Toulouse was in October of 1990, and uh, staying in uh, a small attic near Anatole de France, actually with Salvador Barbero, who was teaching there at the time, and uh, I could see the excitement that was being built and uh, the quality that was being attracted. And, and what was really impressive was the, the coalition that Jean-Jacques Lafont was building between researchers and government and industry and you know, really trying to solve important problems for society. And I, I, I really am impressed by how, how strong the, the foundation he built has been and, and how it has continued to thrive under the leadership over the years. And it's, it's a, a great honor um, to be here. So let me share my screen here and we will uh, start with the there. Can everybody see that? Hopefully. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very Excellent. much. Okay. So I'm going to talk about networks and their consequences and some of the dynamics. And as Karine pointed out, this will be a combination of theory, empirics, and some field experiments. And I, I'm going to start with just a couple of pictures because I think this is really the way to start to understand why networks are helpful in understanding human behavior. And I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, a high school. I'm going to show you a, a picture of friendships in an American high school. And each little dot is a student. And there's a line between the, the two, two students if, they're, if they did at least three activities together in a week. So this is from a data set I explored with Sergio Carini and Paolo Pin a few years back. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two, two different pictures. This first one is a picture of a fictional high school, not a real high school. And here, I, I, I drew this by taking the, the same number of friendships that, that are going to be in the real high school, but putting them down completely at random, okay? So this is a high school with no real social structure to it. It's just a, it looks like a spaghetti bowl, right? So it's just, uh, you know, a bunch of students, random friendships. And, and the next one I'm going to show you is a picture of the real high school. And, and I want you to see the differences that you can see between the first high school, you know, the the fictional high school that has random friendships and the one that has real friendships. And the, the way that this picture is drawn is by what's known as a spring algorithm. So what it does is it starts just with things at random and then if it picks two students and if they're, if they're friends, it moves them closer together. And if they're not friends, it moves them farther apart. So it's a way of, of having the computer find the patterns in the network. And what you'll begin to notice is two things compared to the first one. One is that there's a strong split here. So if you sort of go across the middle of this, let's see if I can actually, um, you know, so there's sort of a, uh, a sort of a north-south divide here where uh, above and below the, you see friendships densely packed in, in these two different places. Um, the other thing to notice is that there's more inequality in the friendships here. So you see people with no friends, sort of a sad fact of high school, and then you see people with many friends. So there's people who have many friends, people who have no friends. And that's quite different from this one where there's no divide and everybody has at least one friend and it's much more equal in terms of the distribution. So this means that there's, there's patterns here. And then let me color the nodes and I'm coloring the nodes by race, in this case, self-reported ethnicity of the students. 
So they could report that they were either, in this case, black, Hispanic, white, Asian, um, and so forth. The, the blue dots are the ones who reported themselves as black, uh, yellow are white, pink are um, at least two different categories, red are Hispanic, and then blue ones are missing data. But what you begin to see is that this, this high school is split along these ethnic lines. And so these things affect behavior. So they'll affect who knows what, what kind of information flows through the network, what kind of access people had. And on, on Monday, I talked a bit about how this affects labor markets. But more generally, you know, the, the fact that networks have these identifiable characteristics has consequences. And it, it, it affects things like job information. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about microfinance participation, polarization, diffusion, contagions, how these things play out in networks with these kinds of shapes. And another theme that we'll talk about is that the networks themselves are influenced by the institutions and markets and things around them. So how, who we interact with and how we choose to make those interactions depend on what's going on around us. And so we're gonna look at the network impact, some of the feedback and dynamics and what's been going on in terms of technology. So at the end today, I'll talk a little bit about what, what kinds of trends we see due to technology in the, in the world today. Okay, so in terms of an outline, I'm gonna talk about how networks can impact a market first, then we'll reverse things and talk about how networks end up being changed by that market. And then I'll talk about two competing trends that we see in the world today. One is that we see increasing density and interconnections. So we're able to travel more, we're able to communicate across great distances. Um, that affects spreading, but it also, we're also seeing increased polarization and increased segregation at the same time. And so we'll talk about these two different trends. So let me start with the diffusion on networks and how that impacts markets. And I'm gonna talk about the, some of the work that Karin mentioned um, with Abhijit Banerjee, Runchandra Sikhar, and Esther Duflo. And I'll start with two studies that we did um, looking at, at microfinance spread in India. And this became a, a more than a decade long study now. <clears throat> We've been at it for, I guess, about 14 years. And the latest study we're doing is sort of how the networks are evolving. But I'll start with some of the, some of the background information and then talk about what we know for how these networks are changing. And so the first part is you know, the way that this study started is we wanted to figure out how networks were helping information spread about microfinance in uh, an area and how to best get information out and to spread that information. And in terms of basic background, the um, reason that we got involved with, we got involved with a bank in Southern India that was trying to spread loans among poor people. And the problems that they were facing were that microfinance participation was varying very widely across different villages that they would go into. So some villages they would go in, they wouldn't get anybody to participate. Other villages, they were getting a lot of participation and the villages were fairly similar. And they were trying to figure out why it was that the news was spreading well in some places and not in others. And they were using essentially a word of mouth dissemination. And I can talk about that um, if, if people are interested, but the, the idea was that they would go into a village and try to um, talk to important people in the village and ask those people to spread information. And they were hoping that the information would spread organically um, through the village. And some places it was spreading well and other places it wasn't spreading. And so one question is, you know, how important are these initial positions in the network? And as we saw in that high school network, there are people who have very different characteristics in terms of how well connected they are. And if you hit the right people, sometimes you can get news to spread and not otherwise. So I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit about the data set. So we were working in Karnataka, which is um, Southern India. We were working in villages um, around Bangalore. Villages on typically had about 200 households per village. And we worked with 75 different villages. And the bank um, eventually entered 43 of these villages and offered loans. So these are places that didn't have access to loans before. And 32 of them, they did not enter due to the financial crisis. So in 2009 and 10, they stopped lending. And so um, one thing we'll be able to do is we surveyed the networks and mapped out the networks before they entered and then after. And we'll be able to see how the villages that got microfinance differ from what happened in the villages that didn't. Um, 
So I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a little while. But first of all, let me just talk about how they tried to get information about these loans out and how that works. And a little bit of the role of theory in networks together with the empirics. So the, the per capita income in these villages is roughly um, somewhere between one and five dollars a, a day, depending on the villages you're in. Uh, the loans are on the order of 10,000 rupees, so roughly $200 at that time. Um, they were loans given to um, women aged 18 to 57 uh, for 50 weeks and at interest rates that are roughly high credit card interest rates, so a little more than 30%. And they were what are known as Grameen style loans, so that these are loans where women were put into groups of five and they were jointly liable for each other's repayments. Okay, so this is sort of a standard microfinance loan. And these loans, even though they're small numbers, for, for the, these individuals, it's actually a large amount of money and, and enough money to help them um, spread, you know, uh, smooth their income and so forth. So we were in Karnataka, this part of India, um, roughly in a band around uh, Bangalore, just to give you pictures of what some of these villages look like. Um, you know, this is a picture from one of the village. Uh, you know, they're, they're sort of uh, fairly small, poor, um, agricultural, uh, uh, a little bit of sericulture, you know, silkworm production. Um, here's another picture of one of the villages. So these are the sorts of areas that um, the loans were going out in. And what we did is we went into these villages and then mapped out um, various forms of networks. So for instance, this is one of the villages. Um, each little dot in this picture is a, uh, an adult and the groups of dots are households. And here, this is the, these lines between the different dots are we asked the people, um, if you had to borrow or lend 50 rupees for a day, who would you go to? So we asked people who they were borrowing and lending from. And then there's an arrow between two households if those households are borrowing and lending from each other. And then we asked a bunch of other things. So this is the borrowing network in more detail. But we also asked, you know, who do you go to temple with? Who would you go to pray with? Who do you go to for important advice? Um, who comes to you to borrow kerosene or rice? So these are heating oils and so forth. Who do you go to in an emergency for medical help? Um, and so, so from all of these different things, we can build a network. And what's going to be important, we'll work with households as the units. And we'll keep track of whether two households are in contact with each other or not. So did they, did they do something together? And so from all these things put together, we can track um, which households are in touch with each other. Um, here also is just a picture of, this is one of the villages, village 26. This is the kerosene rice. And now what I've done is I've put all those dots together into the households, but I've also um, split it by the caste designation. So the blue are the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, the relatively disadvantaged groups. And the red are the general or otherwise backward castes, so the relatively advantaged castes. And one thing you can begin to see here is you see sort of, you know, a split roughly between the, um, you know, the, the different caste groups. So you have relatively advantaged castes and relatively disadvantaged castes not having many friendships with each other. So here you have about a 15 times higher chance of having a friendship within those, um, within your caste side than the other. You also notice actually that the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes sort of split down here. So you can sort of split this village into three different pieces. And, and that has consequences for sort of, you know, how, how these people behave and what kind of information. So there could be information that's flowing from person to person in this part of the network that doesn't get to this part of the network or vice versa. So these patterns in the network will make a difference in terms of how information flows. Okay, um, so uh, the information passing that we looked at, the first part of this was, you know, do the initial injection points that the bank comes in and, and talks to, does that help spread the news about microfinance? Does it matter? And how should we measure their role? Okay, and I think, you know, there's, it, there's important evidence that, you know, actually going back to uh, 
uh, Georg Simmel in 1903, talking about how important people's position in the network can be for, for getting information out and so forth. And that's been um, studied in a, in a long series of different works in, in sociology, economics, and other places. But here, what we're going to try and do is, is understand exactly how you measure this and what was going on in these particular villages. And this is where some of the theory will come in. So the, the first question you know, in, in networks we get to is, how central is somebody? And the most obvious answer is um, just counting how many friends people have. So how, how connected are they? And, and people that with the most connections are, are thought of as the most central. And this is something, you know, with, on, on Twitter, people count how many users you have, uh, uh, followers you have, and, and generally in Facebook, people, you know, track how many friends somebody has and LinkedIn and so forth. So there's, you know, just measures of how many people could you reach by, by, by shouting out. And degree centrality, this just counting degree, degree is just the number of friends that somebody has would pick out, you know, for instance, these two nodes in this network, one with seven and one with six. And it's sort of a first count of, of how well connected somebody is. Um, but, you know, if, if we have a network where there might be somebody here, for instance, this person in the middle with, with two connections, this person is actually very well situated, even though they have very few friends. And so if we wanted to spread information in this network, it's possible that this person would actually be a good person to talk to because they're well connected to different parts of the network, which wouldn't come across if we just were counting friends where we, we would miss it. And you know, this person on the very edge of the network with a two looks just as central as this other person with a two. And so there's certain aspects that just counting degree misses, okay? And the, the basic way in which um, mathematicians have first sort of thought about capturing this is something that um, comes out, which is known as eigenvector centrality. And it was um, brought into sociology in the 1970s by Phil Bonasic. But the, the, the notion here is that somebody's centrality, you don't just count how many friends you have, but you count, um, you sum up all the, the centrality of my friends. So I get importance not from how many friends I have, but by adding up the importance of all my friends, okay? And so if I have more important friends, that can be better than having lots of friends. And so this is a, a basic calculation. The, the eigenvector term refers to the fact that you can solve this as a system of equations. So here you have to solve this and there's centrality you know, I have to determine what my friend's centrality is to determine my centrality. So you've got a system of equations and unknowns, but this has a very well-defined and well-studied solution to it. And so in this case, there's a unique vector which tells you what these centralities are. And it's a, it's a, a notion that in this particular network begins to tell us things that are quite different than just counting the friends. So if you look at the eigenvector centralities of these nodes in this network, then you would say, okay, look, this, this one here is actually a 0.3 um, compared to this one over here is a 0.11. So the one on the edge has much lower centrality than the one that's, that has the same number of connections, but their connections are much better connected. The best connection in this whole network is this one here with the, with the six, um, the 0.5, more so than this one over here with a seven. And so eigenvector centrality paints a very different picture than um, you know, just degree centrality. And interestingly enough, the algorithm that was behind the rise of Google as a search engine was built off of something called backrub, which was effectively a variation on an eigenvector centrality calculation. So Google's search engine originally was, was good because it was telling you what things you wanted to look at by looking at the graph of all web pages on the internet and then assigning scores to them and ranking them in this kind of iterative manner. Okay, so those were, those were two options for sort of measuring how central people were in a village and whether those people would be good people for spreading information and whether the bank was doing well because it was hitting the right people in the village. Okay. So for instance, if it went into a village and it talked to this 0.31 person 
you would expect the information to spread much more than if it talked to the 0.11 person. And so maybe that was explaining what was going on. Okay, so those are two different measures. And I think, um, you know, now everybody will be much more familiar with this part than, than they were a few years ago. But what we decided to do was say, look, neither of those measure, measures actually pick up what we think of in terms of spreading behavior. So spreading behavior in, um, of, of information looks a lot more like a contagion process. And so we thought, well, why don't we define centrality off of a contagion process? And this contagion process actually looks a lot like what's known as an SIR model, which now I think people are much more familiar with um, given COVID, but it, it looks at something like a, a spreading behavior. And so what we ask is, how many nodes end up informed if some initial person in the, in the network is initially informed? And then each person who has that information randomly bumps into its neighbors and talks to them with some probability, say P, in each period. And we run that for, for some number of periods. So there's some amount of time that people talk about this subject. They randomly bump into people and happen to talk. How does that spread? Okay. And so let's think of, Let's suppose that you have a, a half a chance to talking to any given one of your friends and say a, a, in a particular week, and we talk about something spreading for four weeks. What would that look like? So if this is the initial node and this was the network, we could just simulate this. We could say, who do we, you know, how do we expect this to spread? And so for instance, you know, with a 0.5 probability and, and four different iterations, this person might tell a friend this person now knows about microfinance. So this person initially knew about it. Now this person knows. This person tells a few friends. This person tells another friend. So after two periods, it's spread a bit. After three periods, it's spread a bit more. After four periods, we would have 13. So we would say, okay, look, this person um, you know, told 13 people if this was the sort of process that was working. And so for a given, type of contagion process, we could estimate how much information flow would this person be responsible for over a given time period. And we could do something for a different person, right? So we go through, we do the same kind of calculation, and we end up with a six. And so we would say, this person is, is different than the other one. And so by, by running these kinds of processes, what we end up with is um, estimates of how important each person would be in a spreading process. Okay. And so we called this diffusion centrality to capture the idea of how good is somebody at diffusing this kind of information. Okay. So one thing that's interesting about diffusion centrality, um, there's this number of periods that we're talking about. How long is this going on? And if it goes on just once, then effectively, all you get to do is, is talk to your immediate friends. And so people who have more immediate friends are gonna be more central than other people. So if T was just one and we just did this once, then that would be the, you know, it would look like degree centrality. And if T goes on infinitely often, then things have a chance to keep moving through the whole network. And it turns out that if communication happens once, then diffusion centrality is actually just proportional directly to degree centrality. So on the one hand with very short periods, degree centrality looks like how quickly things get out and you don't have a chance to iterate. If communication occurs many times, so as T becomes very, very long, then eventually things start percolating through the network and, and diffusion centrality actually converges to eigenvector centrality. And in between, it's different. So it spans these different ones and it looks different in the middle. Okay. So what we, what we're thinking then is the bank went into different villages and the bank's strategy was to try and find central people, but they didn't have network information. So the way that they thought of finding central people was to identify people that they thought were important. So they looked for um, shopkeepers. They thought they'd be in touch with a lot of people, teachers and self-help group leaders. So those were the categories of people that they, they looked for. So when they went into a village, they looked for those people and they told them, um, look, we're a microfinance organization. We're coming in, we're gonna offer loans. Please tell your friends, tell them to spread the news 
and then we'll come back and, and meet with you and uh, try and spread microfinance information. Um, and then we'll offer loans. So what was happening was in some villages, the teacher happened to be very central. In other villages, the teacher happened not to be very central. And so by, by going through these villages, we can see who they told and then see how things spread. And just to give you some, an idea, so what we can do is, is look at oops, um, how, how well the information spread through the, the villages and how that depended on um, different things. And so um, we can ask how much of a microfinance participation can we explain by looking at these different characteristics, just pure the village characteristics. So some villages are, were less segregated than others. Some were more segregated in terms of the, that homophily kind of splits that I showed you earlier. Um, then we can use the degree centrality of the leaders so we can explain a little more than 25% of the variation by just looking at the village characteristics. When we add how, how many friends the um, teachers, self-help group leader, and shopkeepers had, then we can explain up to a little more than 30%. Same thing with eigenvector centrality. But then if we use diffusion centrality, we can explain um, a little more than 45, about 47% of what's going on in the across villages. So we get much more explanatory power. And in fact, by using the um, diffusion centrality, if we actually fit the, the process and the T, so we estimate how long people talk about things, you can get this up to about almost 70%. So if we are actually fitting the diffusion centrality and fitting that P and T. So here, this is with a, a P and a T that are calculated in a manner that is sort of, um, we explain to be robust across different applications, but if we actually fit that, we can get even a, a better fit. So what's the, what, what's the sort of message here? The position of people makes a big difference in information flows, and it makes a difference in terms of explaining whether or not you're going to man, manage to get information out, in, in, in this case, about a, a loan program to the, to the people in the villages. Okay. Um, let me say just a, a couple of words about uh, how you might, so, so one um, issue that we faced in doing this was that we went into these villages and were able to map out these networks quite extensively. That was a fairly expensive undertaking. And if the bank was going to go to every household and ask them and survey them, they could just offer the microfinance directly. So what they also wanted was um, how, how can we actually find central individuals without going into the villages and mapping out all the networks? So if we don't have network information, is there a way to find central individuals? And so what we thought about doing was let's just ask people, okay? So, so we're gonna go into the villages and we're just gonna ask people who would be a good person for diffusing information you know, we, we weren't going to ask people who's diffusion central, but we, we wanted to ask them, um, you know, how do we find people who would be good news spreaders? Okay. And so we went into 33 of the villages um, and asked people, who are the people that you would suggest that we talk to if we want to spread information? Okay. And just to show you, um, we, we call those as gossips. So we refer to these people as the gossips in the village. So who would be a good person for us to spread news? Who are good people that, for, for spreading information? And here's the, you know, so different households could be named. So we went into and asked a lot of the households. And so some of the, the households were named by almost everybody in the village. So there's, you know, one particular household, everybody said, look, you have to go to that person. That's the person you want to talk to if you want to get information out. And here's the diffusion centrality of the, of the households and then how many nominations they got. And so what you can begin to see is if you find households that got lots of nominations, they tend to be um, fairly central in terms of diffusion centrality. So even though we can't necessarily go in, you know, if I asked who should I talk to at Toulouse School of Economics in order to spread news, uh, most people there would have a pretty good idea of who's a person who talks a lot and is well connected and would be a good news spreader. Um, you could tell me, and it, it might not be, you know, just sort of an obvious person in terms of position or something. It, it, it might be somebody who everybody knows is, is 
sort of socially well connected um, and a good person for news spreading. And so it seems that people are able to do that quite well. And so then we went ahead and tested that. And um, we actually did an experiment. So we've been working with the Haryana government and uh, Haryana is trying to get um, its villages to vaccinate their children. And so we have been doing experiments on trying to get information about vaccination programs out inside these villages. And so we went into 521 villages and what we did is we did four different ways in which we spread information about the vaccine program. One, we just picked households at random and we said, okay, look, tell your friends. Others, we went and did this gossip procedure. So we went in and we said, look, who should we talk to? And then we, we went and found those households and uh, who should we talk to if we wanna spread information? Then we found those households and said, look, we have a vaccine program, tell your friends about it. Then we also tried just trusted. So we asked, who are people in your village that you think are really trusted individuals that everybody, if they say something, everybody believes it and would follow their advice. So we had trusted, and then we had trusted gossips. So people who are both trusted and were named in the gossip as a, as a person that would be central. And then we, we put in six seeds in each village. And then we also had, uh, you know, we were doing a bunch of other things too. So we had reminders that went out and payments and so forth. But in terms of the spread, here's what happened in terms of when we went into the villages. So this is sort of the per person we talked to how many um, extra people end up showing up as, as part of the program, a trusted person would generate about two, two other people coming to the program on average. Um, a gossip person would generate almost five and a trusted gossip would generate over seven. So by going through and asking not just who's trusted, but who do you think is central, um, they seem to be picking out people who have high diffusion centrality and when we see this, you know, we see a, a marked increase in the participation rates that we got in the immunization program by figuring out who these people were that were both um, had a trust level and um, gossip. Okay. So um, just a few lessons from these, th this first study. Um, network positions have economic consequences. There's lots of different ways to be central. And they, they matter in different, uh, different situations. And in particular, diffusion centrality seems to be an important one for getting information to spread in, in different settings. And um, people can identify these individuals. So um, people are pretty good at doing that. And uh, you know, actually, let me mention one thing. This is a little bit surprising to me, and partly because the, there's a, a whole series of studies in the sociology literature that ask people to map out their networks. So we give you a pencil and paper, and then we give you, a, like, suppose you, we go into a company and we say, who's friends with whom or who communicates with whom? You know, draw out the network. So um, David Crackhart and others have done a bunch of work on this. And I give you that pen and pen, uh, paper, it's very difficult for people to draw their networks. So people are not very good. They can name their own friends, but naming who, which of their friends talk to each other and who talks to other people. So if you ask me to actually map the network, people are not very good at it. Um, and yet they're pretty good for picking out central individuals. And in, the, in one of these papers, we actually build a theory for that. And, and the theory is based off diffusion centrality, which is, you know, if somebody's really central, I'm going to hear news from them quite often. So news from them will make it to me if, if people are really central. And so then I will be hearing about people who are more central and I won't be hearing stuff from people who are less central. And so the extent that I can keep track of that, I'll be able to find those central people just by, by being a good listener in a network. So even though I can't map the network, I can still identify who's spreading information well. Okay, so you know, diffusion on networks sort of impacts the market, positions matter. So the networks can help us understand what's going on in a market setting. And the, the part that was sort of serendipitous in this study was that once the financial crisis came and the banks stopped going into villages, um, roughly half these villages got microfinance and the other half did not. And so what we could begin to trace was 
does the, you know, the availability of microfinance change the social structure of these villages? And so that's the next part I want to talk about is just a little bit of the dynamics of can we see how a market changes social structure? And you know, there's a quote from Ken Arrow from 1999. I think you know, Ken Arrow is one of these people that it's, it is pretty much impossible to find an area of, of economics that he did not have, um, had not looked at at some point in time. And so he has a quote here, this leads to an important and longstanding question, does the market or for that matter, the, the large efficient bureaucratic state destroy social links that have positive implications for efficiency? So once we put markets in place, does that mean that people don't need to interact with each other as much? And does that sort of destroy the social fabric, which can be important in making sure that we um, are cohesive in other ways? And so um, what we've done is, this is a work with Abhijit Arun and Esther again, but also with Emily Breza and Cynthia uh, 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 Kinnan. And here, what we're looking at is um, work where the, the, we're looking at the same villages and we have the networks from 2006. So these are villages that we, that, you know, we went into these 75 villages, we um, surveyed them all. 2007 to 10, this bank entered 43 of the villages and offered loans, but it did not enter the other 32. So 32 of the, of the villages did not get microfinance, 43 did. And then we went back in afterwards and we resurveyed the villages to get the before and after networks. Okay, so we can see um, how big are the networks, who's connected to whom, how do these networks change between 2006 and 2012, and how did it depend on whether you had microfinance present in the village or not? Okay, so what happens? So these are the non-microfinance villages and the before and after, and these are the microfinance villages on the right before and after. And this is just the, the frequency of links. So this is just the, you know, on average, how many other households, if you look at two households, what's the chance they're connected? Um, in the non-microfinance villages before it was almost 10%. Um, afterwards, so in all these villages, there was a little bit of decay in the network. So all these villages saw some uh, loss in their networks. And, and one thing that was going on at the time, these are villages around Bangalore and there was some outward migration. Um, so some of the villages were losing people to, uh, you know, people were starting to work in, in Bangalore or commuting around. So, so there was some general degradation of these villages just during this time period. But what you'll see is that there's about a twice as large loss in the microfinance villages as in the non-microfinance villages. So the microfinance villages get loans and people no longer need to borrow and lend from each other. And that decreases some of the activity um, in those villages. And I wanna spend time you know, digging a little deeper into that to explain sort of how that was changing and what the patterns of that change look like. So um, one thing we wanna do is, is uh, in the microfinance villages, not everybody got a loan. It's not as if the whole village ended up participating in this. So there are some people who ended up participating and other people who didn't. And we want to be able to trace not only how does the network change, but how does it change among the people who got loans compared to the people who did not get loans. Okay. And so what we did was what's known in, in the medical literature as propensity scoring. And this is a, a technique that made it into economics, I think in the 1990s. But what we needed to do is the following. So we have villages that got microfinance and villages that did not. And let's suppose we have a household that got a loan in the microfinance village. We'd like to know what would have happened to them in the alternative universe where they didn't get a loan. They, they were in a village that didn't get the microfinance. So we need to be able to match them. So we wanna look at a household in the microfinance village and say, here's a comparison household that looks the same in a non-microfinance village that also would have gotten a loan had that had it been in, in their village. And so we, we want to be able to make these comparisons. So we want to be able to match up which are the households that are very likely to get microfinance, which are the households that aren't. And so what we used is we used a, a machine learning technique um, known as a random forest algorithm to 
actually assign to go through and look at a household and say, okay, look, we can see all kinds of things about this household. We can see what caste they are, what religion they are, how many people are in the household, what employment they have, um, you know, what the ages are. We have all this information and we can use that to predict, are they going to get a loan or are they not going to get a loan? And, you know, their education levels and so forth. And so what we could do is then break these into two different categories, people who are highly likely to get loans and people who are unlikely to get loans. So we call these highs and lows. And in the microfinance villages, the ones that we designate as highs, so we run this algorithm and then it picks out the highs, they, they have about a 46 to 47% chance of getting a loan. The ones that we categorize as lows, about 4% chance of getting loans. So the demographics are pretty good at picking out, and we also use network position and so forth. So we can pretty well predict who's going to end up getting a loan and who's not going to get up, uh, get a loan. And then we we can do is compare the networks of highs and the networks of lows and see how they're changing in the microfinance villages compared to the non-microfinance villages. Okay, so that's a mouthful. There's a lot going on here, but we're trying to figure out you know which households got loans, which ones didn't. Um, and how did it would what would have happened to them had they not had microfinance around? Would their network have changed in different ways? Okay, so here's what happens in terms of the um, link probabilities. So first of all, we can look at the how many we look at the connections between highs and highs. These are people that are are likely to get um, loans, and the the blue ones on the left are the non-microfinance villages. How how likely are these? households to be connected to each other. And then the green are the microfinance villages. How likely are they to be connected to each other? And what you'll see is pretty clearly all of the households are losing links in the microfinance villages compared to the non-microfinance villages. So the borrowing and lending network disappears in um, among the villages, but it's not just among the high highs. These are the people who are actually getting the loans. It's also disappearing among the highs and lows, which you would imagine, but the low lows are also losing links. And they're actually, um, it's hard to tell from this picture, but they lose them at the, at the highest rate. Okay, so in, in terms of what's happening here, um, we have uh, a situation where the, um, the, the highs end up getting access to loans we would imagine, you know, it's it's pretty clear that now they have formal loans from a bank. They don't need to borrow and lend from each other anymore. But it's it's less obvious why that should impact the rest of the village. Why are these people who are very unlikely to get loans, many of whom are are some of the poorest people in the village, um, why are they not uh, connecting to each other and anymore? And this taught us some lessons. So we spend a lot of time doing some, some structural issues in terms of trying to figure out, you know, how can we explain this disappearance? And what seems to be going on, and, and also anecdotally, when we talk to people in these villages, um, there's a, a, a sort of an effort of socializing. And what tends to happen is that you know, people spend time, say, in the central square, just talking to each other. They go to um, tea shops. Getting tea together is a, is something very social. And bef when before microfinance, everybody was doing this fairly actively. And then once microfinance came into a village, the people who actually got loans would tend to come less frequently to the square or to the tea shops and so forth. And that made these places less attractive for everybody. And so that means that other people started spending less time. So they talk about, oh, you know, we don't spend as much time in the square or the or the tea shop and so forth anymore. And what happens then is you get less socializing, not just among the people who are getting loans, these sort of high probability people, but also among the people who did not get loans. And that carryover means that there's a broader effect on the village. And, you know, this socializing maintains these old relationships and the way you meet new ones. Um, and there's complementarities here. The more others socialize, the easier it is to maintain your relationships, the more active people are. And, and that means that you see things um, spreading, not just from the highs, but also to the lows. And as one sort of extra piece of this, we can look at the borrowing and lending network. 
And then look at the non microfinance and microfinance villages that you're seeing the drop in the highs borrowing and lending activity, the lows borrowing and lending activity. Um, and then here we've got the advice networks as well. And, and so the fact that you see this happening almost equally as much in the advice network as the borrowing and lending network means that you see um, a change that is having spillovers, not only beyond the people who got the loans, but also in relationships beyond the types of relationships that are just financial relationships. So in these villages, a lot of people, you know, if I'm talking to you and I ask you for a loan or something, or I, I, um, I'm also talking to you and, and maybe helping you out with your kids or giving you advice and so forth. And so there's all kinds of other things that happen through these relationships and those things are disappearing as well. Okay, so um, one last piece to this puzzle. So um, there were two things about the Karnataka experiments that were um, somewhat uh, that, that we wanted to find out more about. One is that we did not control which villages the bank went into and which villages it did not. So it was not a randomized experiment. So the bank chose which 43 villages it went into first. And so we were worried that maybe there was some kind of contamination there. Um, the other thing is that we did not collect information in, in the end about how much income people had and how much consumption they had and so forth. So we couldn't tell whether the disappearance of the networks was actually having an effect on people's well-being and um, overall consumption patterns. And so we also have um, additional, an, a, another study then that we are, are able to use data from where we went back into, we, there's the, in Hyderabad, um, a microfinance study that was randomized where 104 villages got um, into the study, half of them got microfinance. So, it, and this was roughly in the same period. And what we did was we went into there afterwards in 2012 and gathered data in these Hyderabad villages, but we also um, measured consumption and income. So we went in and measured the networks, but we also measured the consumption and income. And so from that, we got you know, um, several things. First, we see extremely similar effects in sign and magnitude of the disappearance of the relationships. So when we look across Hyderabad, when we look at the 52 villages that got microfinance compared to the 52 that don't, we see a similar drop in the percentage of links in the um, microfinance villages compared to the non. But then we also have um, information about consumption and income. And when we look at the lows in Hyderabad, what we see is um, they don't lose income, but what we see is an increased correlation between their income and consumption, almost a two thirds increase, okay? So what does this mean? This means that these people um, who are not getting loans, but are losing relationships are actually seeing that their income um, fluctuations are, are pushing their consumption fluctuations more than they would have otherwise. So we see um, a situation where here we end up uh, having a, an increased relationship between consumption and income, which means they're, they're, they're not risk sharing as well. So we see a decrease in risk sharing in the Hyderabad villages that got the um, uh, microfinance and among households that did not get the microfinance. The non-microfinance take, uh, takers are, um, are, are sort of less able to sm smooth income here. The H's don't see this increase. So the people who actually get the loans um, don't, you know, their, their correlation between consumption and income doesn't change, but it's the ones that, that don't get the loans. So sort of, you know, lessons of this, we see complementarities, spillovers, or economists, we, we call this GE effects, sort of general equilibrium effects. We're seeing movements, um, you know, the, the loans come in and that changes the social interactions, that it changes it among people who aren't involved in that market at all. And it's, um, you know, it's partly because these links are not independent, people socialize, and it, it helps us understand what's going on and sort of imperfect search for others to, to relate to them is sort of why these low lows are affected. Um, there's something called multiplexing in sociology, and it refers to the fact that our relationships are multifaceted. 
So it's not just that we borrow and lend money together, but we also share advice or, you know, with your colleagues over lunch, you might be talking about all kinds of things um, and giving them information, not just about uh, market opportunities, but other opportunities. And so the fact that we lose some of the social fabric, then we, we care about this, not just because of the social fabric, but also because of the implications for other activities. So let me just say, you know, some of the implications of this, what it says is exposure to formal loans changes social fabric in measurable ways, and it has under, unintended consequences. So the lows are losing relationships, even at a higher rate. Um, that's increasing their income variance, or not the income, I should say consumption variance for the lows. Um, and non-money relationships are, are affected as well. Um, it could increase inequality. We don't have a, a good measure of this, but we know that it's at least in, increasing inequality in the network itself. Um, and I think the, the message is not that we want to stop markets from moving into these places or we want to stop microfinance, but that we need to take this into account in policy and mechanism design. So we do need to understand how one, one, play, uh, one type of intervention can impact uh, other things that we didn't intend it to and make sure that when we go in that we take care of the individuals, for instance, that might not be involved in that program um, because they might be affected um, as well. Okay, so um, just in terms of outlines, you know, I think what we've looked at it shows that these networks have some consequences. The networks are changeable. They do change in reaction to the, to the world. And I want to talk just sort of in these, you know, last, uh, say, 10, 15 minutes about competing trends that we see in the world. So there are, you know, sort of two things happening to our world at once. And one is that we see in sort of an increase in density and interactions and spreading uh, around the world. So, you know, we can call this globalization, but basically we're able to keep in touch with each other. Right now we're having a Zoom meeting, you know, a, a, across continents. Um, 20 or 30 years ago, we would not have had this technology, right? We could not have this um, going on. So there's an ability for people to connect at greater distances, and that means that there's more interaction and more possibility of information spreading or other kinds of things. But at the same time, there's also a possibility of increased segregation and homophily. So the ability to connect also comes with it some selectivity. And I'll show you some data on that. You know, the, the ability of people to choose who they're interacting with sort of moves us in the opposite direction. So we can become more connected and more segregated at the same time. And, and I, I sort, sort of want to go through some of these. Um, and I'll start with just some pictures. And it's hard to find data sets that span uh, centuries and networks. So what I've done here is worked with what's known as the ATOP data set. And this is from a study I did with Stephen Nye. And this is going to be interactions across countries. So now instead of people, each node is a country. And two countries have a relationship together if they were allies. That means that they had some kind of treaty in, in place. And we'll start right after the Napoleonic um, period, so 1815. And then we'll, we'll just sort of go forward. And I'll, I'll just show you pictures of what these looked like at 10-year snapshots, right? So we start in 1815. And so here we have Russia, Austria-Hungary, Germany, and so forth. So we have a, a bunch of different countries. They're all... Um, having relationships with each other. Uh, here's France. And then we'll just track this over time, right? So we have 1815, 1825, 35, 45, right? So we get into 1850s, 60s, 70s were a period where there was not much uh, alliance going on, 80s. And what you can begin to notice is this network is bouncing around a lot, right? It's, it's changing a lot. We get to 1910, 20, 30s, 40s, and now you begin to see a, a big change, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000. And so you begin to see that, you know, by um, you have France down here, you get different positions and so forth, but you see a much, much denser network, okay? 
And so these alliances have been getting much denser over time. There's many more countries that are allied now than there were before. And one thing that this correlates with quite strongly is the trade uh, increase in trade. So right, roughly in the 1950s is also where you see trade costs decrease, container shipping, shipping improves, you see a dramatic decrease in trade costs, and you see more and more countries trading with each other. And so beforehand, pre-World War II, if you go back, you know, before the 1940s and 50s, countries had on average two and a half allies, two thirds chance they last five years. Post-World War II, they're much more connected, 10 and a half allies, about a 95% chance that any given alliance will still be there five years later. So you see a denser network and a much more stable network. And that, you know, this increased trade relationships has led to increased, um, as we see in these networks, we see increased alliance networks. And the other aspect that came with it, um, this is from our, our data with, with Stephen Nye again, these are um, what are known as courts of war uh, mid fives, which are military interstate disputes of level five. So these are conflicts between countries that involve at least a thousand casualties. So think of them as, a, as some kind of war. And what you see is you see about a tenth as many um, post-1950 as you saw pre-1950. So you, know, you saw this period, right now we're in the most peaceful period that, that humanity has seen at least in the last two centuries um, by a lot. And, and part of this is this you know, globalization has led to increased trade and in the paper, we, we go through a lot of sort of, you know, um, time varying econometrics. We don't have exogenous variation here that allows you to, to do a causal inference. But what we can show is that the timing of trade and so forth correlate pretty, pretty strongly with a hypothesis of, you know, trade leads to countries to have common interests, which means that they don't want to attack each other and they'd even want to protect each other. And, and that, once you start putting it into a network context, means that you get a more global society, which ends up being um, much uh, safer in terms of um, interstate wars. So increased trade, alliances, decreased conflict, these things are all closely tied to each other. And you can see that in the networks. Uh, so these global effects are sort of interesting. On the one hand, you get this increased trade, alliances, decreased conflict, that's all great. Um, you also get increased ability of shocks to travel uh, greater distances. So defaults by um, banks um, due to subprime mortgage in the US can influence you know, French balance sheets or Greeks default on loans can affect French banks balance sheets. And so you have you know, interplay between different countries and movements of economic shocks across borders now and as, as we've seen recently with COVID, um, you know, sort of, a, I think, a fascinating number. The Black Plague, if you look in the um, 14th century and you look at the time it took from the, for the plague to get from Marseille to Stockholm, it took four years for it to get that distance. Um, COVID, it took about a month for it to spread pretty much around the world, right? So, so you know, along with this kind of increased interaction and increased trade, you also get transmission of shocks and so it means that we're really in a global world now. We're not in a, um, a world where you've got separate, separate um, different areas interacting uh, on their own. So we've got, you know, this, these networks are spreading more widely. They're spreading around the world. And the last thing I want to talk about then is that we're also seeing more and more of this homophily and segregation in these patterns at the same time. And I can talk a little bit about what some of those pressures are um, in, in those directions. So um, let's have a look here. You know, we, you know, we've looked at two different forms of homophily, right? We saw this in, the, in a high school network. We saw it among castes in Indian villages. It's pretty much, you know, everywhere you go, you will begin to see these kinds of splits in networks. And you see the, these splits um, quite uh, poignantly when you begin to look in, in um, networks, I, I talked about on, on Monday a little bit, some data, you know, you can see them in Facebook and so forth. Let me show you one study, which I think is a, a very telling one. This is by um, a team from Facebook. This is Lada Adamic, Bakshi and Messing. 
it just came out in uh, science um, uh, a few months ago. And what they did was they went and um, characterized people as either conservative or liberal in their political leanings. So they were looking at, at Facebook data and they're looking at people who are either conservative or liberals. And they wanna see how much access does a given person, if I'm a liberal, how much conservative um, information do I see? Postings uh, that would be conservative in nature and how much liberal stuff do I see? And if I'm a conservative, how much um, you know, cross-cutting? So cross-cutting here, percent cross-cutting content means if I'm a liberal, how much conservative material could I see and do I see? And if I'm conservative, how much liberal content could I see and do I see? So am I seeing stuff from the other side of the political aisle, essentially? And what, what they're, so the categorization was um, roughly 40% of the people they could uh, look at as conservative. I won't go through all the techniques they use to categorize people, but so they, they have 40% conservatives, about 45% liberals, and there's about 15% independents. And now, so if you were just randomly, you know, spreading information and shares, uh, you know, things that stories that people share, then um, everybody should see about 45% liberal content and about 40% conservative content. Okay, so that would be sort of the mix you would see. And then what they do is they track um, what's what would you actually see given your friendships. So the what are your friends posting? And now you see this drop. So as a conservative, I'm only going to see about 35% of my friends would ever be posting liberal material. And as a liberal, only about 25% of my friends would ever post conservative material. And then when you look at what I'm actually exposed to from the algorithms, and then what you see, what I actually click on, by the time you get to clicking, the liberals are seeing only about 20% conservative and the um, conservatives are seeing about 28% liberal. And the reason that these are differing a bit is because the um, independents who aren't shown here are, are sharing more liberal content than conservative uh, content. So the, the, the independents tend to be friends with both of these and they should tend to share more liberal content. But what you see is, you know, by the time you get through the network and then through the algorithms that are directing the, the information flow through the network, you begin to see a lot more segregation of the information flows than you would have seen had people just been broadly exposed to stuff in the network. And so this is sort of, a, I think, a study which points to these ideas of echo chambers quite clearly in the fact that the people around you and what you get to see through your social media might be a very different slice of what's out there than what's, um, you know, what, what's available in the broader world. And just one picture which I always find fascinating to see whether or not this is playing out in politics. Um, so this is a picture of the US Senate and they're color coded by political party. So the blues on the left are the Democrats, the reds, they look a little pink uh, on the right are the Republicans. And this is code I got from a computer scientist. And um, what this does, what I did is there's there's a connection here between two senators if they voted at the same way on bills at least half the time so they're agreeing more often than they're disagreeing and then they'll be connected and in um this is 1990 about 82 percent of the senators were linked to each other so most of the senators were agreeing more than than disagreeing um this is 2015 so this is before trump was elected and now you see, and again, this is not, you know, the, the computer drew this picture in terms of figuring out where the nodes should go and where the split is. So I didn't pull these apart. Um, now you see only 53% linked and many more of the links are within party than across party. And so, you know, you can begin to put in your favorite Mitch McConnell, Diane Feinstein, here's Sanders, Durbin, Schumer, Graham, Rubio, Cruz, you know, so, so you begin to see them splitting and they, they, they form positions in these, um, in this network, you see a much more split network. And, and certainly this isn't unique to American politics. Um, finding French poli political maps is a little harder, but, you know, this is just a, a quick picture of, um, you know, if you look around France uh, in the 2017 election, who is the biggest vote getter? 
and by region and you know Macron in, in certain regions, Le Pen in other regions, Fillon, uh, Mélenchon, you know, you can look in different regions. And, and so you do see splits and so forth in, in where people are located and who they're interacting with and what they might be exposed to in terms of political views. And that plays out in the politics. So just as a last slide, um, one thing I find fascinating to see, you know, we, we, we see more um, algorithms interacting in our life. Um, this is a study from Mark Rosenfeld uh, and, and co colleagues a sociologist at Stanford. And what they did is they tracked, they've been tracking people in a survey for many years. They look at um, uh, people and their romantic partner and ask, how did you first meet? And if you go back to the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it used to be friends and family, and then at school. And if you look, starting in the 1990s, um, online takes off. So more and more people first met their partner online. I mean, now it's the majority and uh, the plurality. And in fact, um, you know, bar actually goes up as well, um, which has to do with some of these apps are used, you know, like um, people actually use the apps in bars to meet people. But, uh, you know, this is saying that, that things are more mediated. And I think some of the technological changes and challenges are that these platforms, they benefit from our attention and they're competing with each other. And those algorithms are built to sort of find people that look just like you to be your friends and try and put you together to match you up along you know, dimensions that you are, are looking similar to that individual. They wanna offer news that resonates with you. So they, they try and detect your news, your political leaning, put the news in that direction. And that can exacerbate the homophily and these sort of echo chamber um, tendencies. So, you know, what. Um, you know, these networks matter, the information flows. Um, we talked about jobs on Monday, microfinance, trade and peace. They have serious economic consequences. Um, they're being changed by the advent of markets and institutions. Uh, we don't have a good understanding of that yet. And I, I think even something we understand less well is the fact that technology is mediating more and more of our interactions. And like it or not, the, 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 the instructions and the algorithms that those platforms have of how to connect people and what to share are making a difference in what we see and, and who we interact with. And we need better understanding of these dynamics and feedbacks. So I think that's a good place to stop. And uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. I think you're you're muted, Karine. Oh, sorry, I said I'm muted. Okay, so thank you for uh, for this uh, fascinating talk. I think we would have uh, loved to have it uh, go on and, and continue. Um, so I've seen that there are a number of questions in uh, in the chat. Um, so maybe it's best if people ask the questions directly. Um, so I see that there is one from Jean. I think I see Jean on my screen. So can I? So I think you should be unmuted, Jean. Are you? Or not? Oh, yeah, Jean, you're muted. So A, yeah, I'm not muted anymore. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. So I can read the questions. Um, I can read it. Uh, so it's on the normative front, uh, going back to the villages in India, and the idea that actually socializing is a good thing, which by and large I will agree with, but of course we also know that we leave uh, villages for cities because villages also are very oppressive, you have to signal all the time, you have to be nice to everyone, you have to conf conform and so on. Is there a way in your, um, in your sample, uh, in your data to to actually tell apart what's good and bad in terms of socialization. I mean, the links you are cutting, um, and I guess you're going to tell me about the low law or something like that, but still, even the low people, they, they might still feel that because the high people are in the village square, they have to go because otherwise they would not get something like advice or, uh, or loan maybe sometimes. Uh, I don't know, I mean, you know. And there is a question also from Peter, which is similar actually on homophily. Um, mm -hmm. 
is that is that a bad thing? I mean, obviously, <laughs> from what you're telling us, it's it's relatively a bad thing, but there might be cases also where it's a, it's a good thing, right? Yes, 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 certainly. So I think um, the homophily, you know, and and these links have multiple purposes, and it's very difficult to 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 map out the overall welfare implications. And I think you're exactly right. So we do see situations where, for instance, the lows are seeing higher, higher variance in their consumption. So we do know that we can have one measure by which it looks like they're getting hurt more in the microfinance villages than non. That doesn't mean that there, there's, you know, overall welfare is, is worse or that other aspects of their life aren't going to get better. And, you know, the, 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 there's always these transition periods where, for instance, in, in these villages, you know, Bangalore is expanding, opportunities to, to get employment outside the villages is increasing, and that changes the social fabric in, a, in basic ways that we don't understand. And I think, you know, the, the main purpose of this study, or the only thing we can conclude, is that there's non-trivial spillovers and sort of general equilibrium effects that are, are not second order, they're really sort of first order effects that are happening in these areas. And so we need better measures of all the different things that happen through these relationships. And, and certainly homophily can be a very good thing in some regards, right? So, you know, if, if I'm a, a young parent, talking to other young parents are probably the best people I could talk to about advice for what to do when my child's sick or, you know, how to take care of my children and what to teach them and so forth. So, you know, homophily can be very, helpful in connecting people who have useful information for each other and exchanges. But it also means that then we're also insulated. And I think one of the key things to, to get out of this is that these networks serve many, many different purposes at the same time. And so that person that you're sharing parental information with could also be the person that could be giving you a job um, opportunity or something. And, and maybe they're great for getting you know tips about the kid, but then they're not very well connected to, to give you information about a job and so forth. And so, so the homophily cuts both ways. And, you know, I, I think having a deeper understanding of all the multitude that, of things that these networks um, influence in terms of our lives and how they interact with each other is something that we, we're, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Matt. I think we have um, a couple of other questions. Uh, James, maybe I think you're you're unmuted. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks. So my question was a little bit technical about the um, the eigenvector connection or centrality seems to be a count of the number of friends that my direct friends have, and it seems to me it would be important whether my friends have the same set of friends or have disjunct sets of friends. Yes. And so there could be some double counting going on there. And then how does that relate to the, the other measure of um, centrality you had? Yes, a good question. So, so uh, you know, what, what the beauty of, of eigenvector centrality and diffusion centrality in terms of, I think, some of what they're capturing about the network is that there's other things going on, as you're pointing out, not just how many friends I have and how many friends my friends have and so forth, but are my friends' friends pointing right back to me? Are they pointing to each other or are they branching outwards? And if you really want to maximize um, eigenvector centrality or diffusion centrality, the, the point at which it would maximize would be something that looks like a tree, where it's actually growing outwards and none of the links are coming back to each other. So both of these things in terms of looking at how many people you reach and so forth um, are maximized in sort of expander graphs that look like trees and, and, and grow outwards rather than ones that have lots of links that come back in on each other. And so those are implicit in those calculations. And part of the reason that I think you know, you see a lot of different measures for centrality is all of these things matter and it's tricky to, you know, to keep track of how they're all interacting and, and they're, they're embedded in, in those calculations. Okay, thank you. So maybe we've got time for one, uh, one last question. Uh, maybe Jacques. 
Hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, Matt. This was a great talk. There was one point which I found a bit disappointing. Uh, it was when you began speaking about the uh, policy lessons from your work on uh, microfinance. I mean, it sounded a bit like, you know, I participate to much too much round tables on uh, digital uh, firms and everybody says we need to study more, we need to think more about it and we need more research. So if you had to make a, uh, I, I know you can't do a scientific work on this, but if you had to uh, do a bet, you know, how would you use what to know now in order to modify the way uh, microfinance is distributed? Yes, um, I, I think what I would do is try to make the loans. So I think you know one one issue about microfinance is it comes in one size fits all loans, and so those loans are attractive to part of the population and not to the other part. So for instance, the highs end up getting the loans and the lows don't, but you know part of it's a mismatch. And so if you could increase the heterogeneity in the sets of loans, uh, 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 that might help the the lows smooth their borrowing. And I didn't actually show the borrowing numbers, but the Lowe's borrowing goes down and their consumption variance goes up. And so part of the reason that they're seeing that increased variance is that they're not seeing the financial, the money lender opportunities that they have are very high interest rates and they're seeing less social connections and they're not taking advantage of the microfinance. And somehow you wanna be able to get income smoothing to them. So it would be targeted income smoothing and figuring out exactly how you can get um, that, that would be the most immediate economic stuff. On the advice networks and so forth, then I, I just, you know, I don't have an answer to, as to how you replace that. But, you know, the, um, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that somehow they're not getting the money injections and the ability to smooth their income across time that they need. And so it would be thinking that, you know, these programs are only going to be taken up by a subset of the population and you want to make sure that that is reaching a greater set of people and maybe one instrument is not enough to do that. And it might also involve some sort of subsidies or consumption subsidies at certain times of year. You know, in these villages, part of it is that these are farmers. And so they have to put every, all their income into investing in seeds and so forth one part of the year. And then basically, if they don't have some way of smoothing income, they starve for part of the year until their crop is ready. And so they go through this really down period in terms of consumption. And that's where having a microfinance loan allows them to smooth it. But the other, you know, the people who don't have those loans aren't able to smooth that income. Okay. Um, so thank you, Matt. So I see in the chat we also had a question from Peter Bayer, but it was kind of incorporated also in, in Jean's question. Um, there is also one from uh, Chuck Mason. Uh, so could you please raise your hand so that I can find you among the participants? Um, there are over 100 people. Uh, sorry, I can't seem to find you. Uh, I mean, raise your hand with uh, with uh, with a tap uh, to raise hands. Otherwise, I will just uh, read. The... Did that work? Okay. Did I was. It... That worked? Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested. Uh, first, I should say, thank you. This was, this was a fabulous talk. I had my choice of three uh, webinars. Uh, I'm in the mountain time zone in the US. Uh, my choice of three seminars at nine o'clock and I picked well. Um, so what, what struck me here was the possible tie into uh, wealth of income disparities over time, the increasing income disparities that we seem to be observing. Microfinance strikes me as just increased economic opportunity and to the extent we've got these very wide differences in, in income opportunities going forward. Is this, I'm wondering what the really dark implications might be for a place like Flint, Michigan that gets left behind and do the, is it beyond the economic effects? Is it, is it a complete collapse of the social networks or a large scale collapse of the social networks and then what kinds of uh, implications might that have across the board uh, along the lines of the torn social fabric? Seems like that, that's kind of the next, that's gotta be the next step in the, in the progression of this logical argument. Right, right. And I think um, that's a very important point. And, and uh, we, right now we're doing 
a study where we're looking at, at people's social capital. And I talked a little bit about that on Monday where we have a large data set and we can track how well people who are relatively poor are connected to people who are more advantaged and how well that does in terms of their mobility and their job opportunities. And in fact, um, I th it, what, what does happen is in settings where like Flint, Michigan or something where people's networks are fairly cut off, the kind of social capital, for instance, that Robert Putnam talked about, which is very introspective, you know, so it's, you know, the, it, does the community, is the community very dense? Well, you can have a very dense network, but if the, if the network is very dense in a very poor community with no, with no connections to the outside, that doesn't bring in the information and the opportunities that are needed for that community itself to, to do well. And so you can see, I, I think, you know, part of this, the puzzle, I have a recent book I wrote, The Human Network, where I talk about the role of social networks in growing inequality. And I think the social fabric does exacerbate a lot of the other influences that are, are pushing towards inequality and understanding the fact that people can be trapped in these networks. Um, it can be a very powerful, uh, device for constraining people and something that we should understand in policies going forward to try and improve this because it's it's not easy to to um, to fix and I think you know just putting money into these areas isn't the answer you really need to help the the people have the information they need and the connections they need to to break out of this and that's a much deeper puzzle Okay, so um, thank you, uh, thank you very much to uh, to to all. Um, I think we're 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 reaching the end of uh, of this session. So thank you again uh, to Matthew and to all the participants, and uh, well, I give back uh, the, the floor to, to Sebastian. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much, Karen. Yes, thank you again, uh, Matthew, for, for for this wonderful talk. It was really a great pleasure to uh, to listen to you and and thank you uh, all for participating in this event. Uh, it was uh, you were more than uh, 120 people at, at one point and and I think it was very very interesting to have the opportunity. Thanks to this uh, technological network that we that we built to to have uh, such a diverse uh, crowd and, and and very wide access uh, over the over the world. Um, so now, uh, uh, for those of you who would like to, uh, to be with excuse, us, yeah. excuse me, Sebastian. I just seen one message from uh, Jennifer Stephenson. Uh, she was asking whether it would be possible for everybody to switch on their video so that we can take a, a group picture. So. Even if you are in pyjama, okay. Even if you're in pyjama, <laughs> that's fine. It's just for the group picture, so. Thank you very much, all. Uh, just to, to have some conviviality also in this event, even if we are not uh, all together. I think it's it's great. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer, for this great idea. And, yeah, just for one minute, just so we can take a picture and uh, keep it for other records. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> you tell us when when it's good, okay? We can. Uh... I think we'll just let them click on the screens for two seconds. Okay, great. Take too long. I just click through the different screens. Nice to see everybody. Oh, I can do this too, actually. Okay, I think that's fine. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Ready? Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I was just mentioning that uh, we, we are now going to proceed with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, official ceremony for the for the Jean Jacques Lafont Prize 2020. And so we are going to uh, to switch to French. So for those of you who would like to enjoy some uh, foreign language uh, or, uh, or enjoy French, you, you are welcome to do so. And uh, and if not, we we'll, uh, we hope to you enjoyed a lot this uh, this event, uh, this this uh, public lecture by by Matthew Jackson. And we hope to see you soon uh, uh, at TSC. Hopefully, uh, the the sooner the better. Okay. Donc, euh, merci, merci beaucoup à tous. Je, je vais peut-être maintenant euh, bien vérifier que euh, nos, nos invités de la mairie... Euh, Monsieur Boyer est là, oui, effectivement. Monsieur Boyer est là, c'est super. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Stéphanie. Je vois aussi que, que Colette Lafont est, est là. Merci beaucoup, Colette. C'est vraiment très gentil d'être parmi nous. Euh, 
Euh, donc, euh, je, 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 vais, je vais refaire un petit, redire quelques mots pour, pour, pour vous accueillir tous. Encore une fois, je, je tiens vraiment beaucoup à vous remercier d'assister à la, à la remise du prix Jean-Jacques Lafont 2020. Nous sommes vraiment très heureux et très honorés que, que Matthew Jackson, qui est professeur à, à l'Université de Stanford aux États-Unis, ait accepté ce prix à la mémoire de Jean-Jacques Lafont. Colette Lafont, donc l'épouse de Jean-Jacques qui, qui est avec nous et aussi avec cette, certaines des, des, des proches de Jean-Jacques et, et, et de Colette, euh, vous assistez à cet événement avec nous et nous sommes vraiment très heureux de pouvoir perpétuer ensemble la mémoire de, de Jean-Jacques dans, dans le cadre de ce, de ce prix. Donc, le prix Jean-Jacques Lafont a été créé en 2005 par la, par la Toulouse School of Economics en partenariat avec la ville de Toulouse et il est décerné chaque année et récompense un économiste international de haut vol dans, dont les travaux scientifiques, dans l'esprit de ceux de, de Jean-Jacques Lafont, offrent des contributions fondamentales euh, et qui sont inspirées en même temps par des, par des questions économiques et sociales euh, et issues du monde, du monde réel. Donc, je, je tiens à remercier sincèrement la mairie de Toulouse pour son soutien continu au, au cours des années dans le cadre du prix Jean-Jacques Lafont, mais aussi plus largement au sein du paysage toulousain de l'enseignement supérieur. Monsieur Maxime Boyer, adjoint au maire de Toulouse, Jean-Luc Moudinck, nous fait l'honneur d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui et interviendra lors de cette cérémonie. Donc, merci beaucoup à vous, monsieur Boyer, d'avoir accepté de dire quelques mots à l'occasion de Jean-Jacques Lafont 2020. Je tiens aussi à remercier toutes les personnes qui, à TSE, à la mairie de Toulouse, ont rendu cet événement possible. On voit que ça a très bien fonctionné jusqu'à présent, on espère que ça va continuer. Il y a beaucoup de monde que, que, que je pourrais citer, mais je voudrais euh, mentionner euh, Stéphanie Risser et Florence Chauvet qui ont apporté un, un soutien formidable euh, à, à toute cette organisation. Ça n'a pas été facile étant donné les, tout, tous les changements que l'on a eus au cours, de, au cours des derniers mois pour s'adapter à la situation sanitaire. Et je voudrais aussi remercier euh, euh, profondément euh, les professeurs euh, Karine Van der Straten et Michel Le Breton qui ont pris un grand soin, euh, euh, qui ont pris grand soin de l'organisation scientifique de ce prix. Euh, je voudrais aussi bien sûr remercier Jean Tirole, qui est président honoraire de TSE, et Christian Gaulier, directeur général de TSE, qui, qui contribue et veille à l'excellence scientifique du projet TSE. C'est vraiment un grand plaisir que d'être réunis tous ensemble euh, ce soir pour, euh, pour célébrer Matthew Jackson euh, et, et, et aussi la mémoire de Jean-Jacques Lafont. Donc, euh, comme, comme ce qui s'est passé juste avant la, la lecture, l'intervention publique de, de Matthew Jackson, Karine Warner Straten nous fait l'honneur et le plaisir de, de dire quelques mots avant, 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 euh, avant la remise du prix formel. Et je, je voudrais avant ça, encore une fois, euh, vous remercier, Matthew. Euh, et je m'adresse à vous en français car je sais que vous parlez bien notre langue. Euh, donc, je voudrais vous remercier en tant que lauréat du prix Jean-Jacques Lafont 2020. Et, et, et aussi, je voudrais vous remercier pour votre disponibilité, votre gentillesse qui ont, qui ont grandement facilité l'organisation de, de cet événement. Et encore un grand merci aussi d'avoir partagé avec nous les, les, les conclusions de votre travail passionnant sur, le, sur, la, sur les réseaux sociaux et, leur, et leurs conséquences économiques et, et, et sociales de manière plus générale. Voilà, donc merci beaucoup. Et donc, je, je passe la parole à, à, à Karine qui va dire quelques mots sur le, sur le parcours scientifique de, de Mathieu. Merci, euh, merci Sébastien. Euh, C'est évidemment un, un plaisir et un, et un honneur de, de faire cette introduction. Je vais redire quelques mots en, en français de ce qu'on a déjà eu un petit peu l'occasion de dire tout à l'heure en, en début de la présentation. Euh, donc, euh, et puis bon, merci aussi pour l'occasion de, de se plonger euh, encore plus que jusque-là dans le, le, la production euh, extrêmement impressionnante et, et très riche de, de Mathieu. Euh, donc, ben pour rappeler juste euh, au départ quelques, quelques éléments de biographie, donc, euh, Matthew Jackson est professeur d'économie à, à l'université euh, Stanford, qu'il a rejoint après euh, 10 ans à, à Northwestern, puis à, puis à Caltech. Euh, la liste euh, des honneurs qui lui ont été décernés est, est déjà très, euh, très longue. Euh, il est un membre de plusieurs académies, sociétés scientifiques euh, euh, très renommées comme euh, le National Academy of Sciences aux États-Unis ou hein, il est un membre de la American Academy of Arts and Sciences, un membre de nombreuses euh, euh, sociétés euh, scientifiques. Il a déjà été de reçu euh, plusieurs prix, dont le prix euh, 
Fundman et euh, le prix Haro. Euh, C'est pour nous un, vraiment un plaisir de, de lui remettre le prix Jean-Jacques Lafont euh, aujourd'hui parce que par euh, de multiples aspects de son, euh, de son travail, euh, Mathieu euh, excelle à euh, ce que Jean-Jacques euh, Lafont voyait comme des... Euh, des, des dimensions euh, extrêmement importantes du, du travail d'économie, c'était d'aider à, à contribuer par la théorie et, et l'empirique à la meilleure compréhension des, euh, des phénomènes économiques et sociaux et, et de, de donner les moyens d'agir, de, euh, de, de proposer des politiques euh, plus efficaces. On, donc son, son œuvre euh, scientifique couvre euh, beaucoup de, de domaines et euh, plus particulièrement euh, ces dernières années, l'économie euh, des réseaux. Alors évidemment, les réseaux sont, sont partout. Euh, les réseaux euh, relient les gens, que ce soit les réseaux d'amitié, les réseaux d'affaires, les réseaux politiques. Euh, et euh, ce dont on manquait jusque-là, c'était d'avoir les bons outils euh, économiques pour les comprendre, pour les analyser. Et ce que Mathieu a fait dans son travail, c'était de nous fournir les, les outils pour pouvoir aller plus loin dans l'analyse, dans, dans l'étude analytique et, et quantitative de ces réseaux. Et ce faisant, on, il a pu revisiter un certain nombre de, de questions importantes en économie qui apportaient de nouvelles intuitions et de nouveaux résultats. Donc la, la lecture publique d'aujourd'hui a montré quelques exemples, mais ça a permis de voir comment sur des questions aussi importante que la microfinance, euh, la santé publique, euh, le commerce international ou, euh, ou l'économie du travail, les, les régulations et le marché du travail, euh, prendre en compte euh, les, euh, ces, ces analyses des réseaux et ce qu'on a pu en apprendre d'autres disciplines comme la sociologie, euh, changer notre, notre vision. Donc, c'est... Encore une fois, une œuvre vraiment très impressionnante et qui continue. Quand on va sur le site de Mathieu et qu'on voit la liste des documents de travail en cours, c'est très, très impressionnant. Donc, rendez-vous dans, dans 10 ans, il y aura encore probablement une, une longue liste qui se, sera, qui se sera ajoutée. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Karine, pour, pour cette présentation et les, tra les travaux de, de, de Mathieu. Euh, je pense qu'on on peut peut-être demander à, à, à M. Boyer de, de dire quelques mots, si, si vous le souhaitez, M. Boyer. Merci, euh, merci, euh, merci monsieur, monsieur le, le directeur. Alors, monsieur... Euh, euh, le président de la Toulouse School of Economics, M. Jean Tirol, M. le directeur, M. Sébastien Pouget, euh, Mesdames, Messieurs, les membres de la famille de Jean-Jacques Laffont, M. Euh, le professeur, M. Matthew Jackson, Mesdames, Messieurs, de la communauté éducative et de la recherche euh, toulousaine en particulier, euh, bonjour ou plutôt bonsoir. Euh, je vous prie de bien vouloir dans un premier temps Excusez Jean-Luc Moudeng, le maire de Toulouse, président de Toulouse Métropole, qui ne peut pas être des nôtres ce soir, euh, mais qui euh, vous salue chaleureusement euh, pour cette remise de prix. À, à vous, organisateurs, à vous, membres du jury, et vous, évidemment, bien sûr, monsieur euh, le professeur, monsieur Mathieu Jackson. Alors, je suis très heureux, en réalité, euh, de représenter Jean-Luc Moudeng pour, euh, pour euh, deux raisons. D'une part, parce que je suis adjoint au maire à l'enseignement supérieur et que cette question de la recherche à Toulouse est un, un élément important de notre territoire et de notre attractivité, mais parce que aussi je suis un ancien étudiant de l'École d'économie de Toulouse, et donc en effet, ça me fait plaisir de revoir quelques professeurs que j'ai pu avoir lorsque j'étais en cours de master ici présent sur cette visio. Alors, le prix Jean-Jacques Lafont, c'est un prix important pour Toulouse. C'est un prix important pour Toulouse qui a été créé en 2005 en partenariat avec la mairie de Toulouse et qui valorise la recherche toulousaine en particulier, mais qui valorise aussi toute la recherche et toute la science économique à travers le monde et euh, permet chaque année de récompenser de grands euh, économistes qui ont participé ainsi à travers leurs travaux à la recherche scientifique. 
on peut citer en effet quelques noms, Joseph Stiglitz euh, ou encore l'année dernière euh, Marianne Bertrand euh, qui était euh, lauréate hein, en 2019. Je ne liste pas l'ensemble évidemment de la liste parce qu'elle est assez, assez longue et ça, ferait, euh, ça serait euh, peut-être un peu trop long. Euh, Monsieur O'Jackson on vous a parfaitement bien décrit il y a quelques secondes, alors je ne vais peut-être pas faire un bis repetita, mais euh, vous avez une brillante carrière, vous avez été et vous êtes professeur dans une prestigieuse université, Stanford, vos travaux participent à la compréhension du monde d'aujourd'hui, en particulier la question des réseaux sociaux qui est un sujet important et qui est un sujet actuel et du quotidien et dont on sait que son évolution sera aussi très importante pour le futur, ce sujet des, des réseaux sociaux. On, on voit donc l'importance de votre apport, euh, de votre apport intellectuel en réalité à la compréhension euh, du monde d'aujourd'hui et à comprendre aussi euh, comment il peut évoluer demain. Euh, vous avez euh, été auteur d'un livre qui est considéré euh, par les chercheurs comme euh, un livre de référence pour l'économie des réseaux, c'est le Social and Net, euh, Economic Network, je dirais, entre guillemets, permettez-moi l'expression, sans vouloir froisser quelqu'un, c'est un peu la Bible du 21e siècle, puisqu'aujourd'hui, on est quand même très digitalisé, et c'est même un peu dommage que vous ne puissiez pas être à Toulouse aujourd'hui, parce que vous voyez derrière moi, en réalité, la salle des illustres, qui est un des plus beaux monuments de la ville de Toulouse. Alors, c'est un peu particulier, vous y êtes virtuellement, mais j'espère qu'un jour, si... Vous êtes de passage à Toulouse, vous aurez le plaisir de venir visiter l'hôtel de ville et en particulier cette magnifique salle qui illustre bien l'excellence que nous avons su préserver à travers l'histoire et qui fait la marque de notre ville. Alors Toulouse est une ville, est un territoire en réalité d'excellence en matière économique. Nous sommes au top 6 européen des villes, euh, des territoires de l'économie et de l'innovation. Nous avons créé au cours des 20 dernières années à peu près 150 000 emplois. L'économie, en effet, est une théorie, mais c'est aussi une réalité du quotidien. La mairie de Toulouse soutient euh, l'école d'économie de Toulouse, évidemment, parce que cette école est un des fleurons euh, de la recherche euh, académique et de la recherche fondamentale euh, de, du tissu toulousain et qui fait l'excellence de l'enseignement supérieur à Toulouse. Et puis, au vu de la situation de la crise sanitaire, la ville de Toulouse et Toulouse Métropole s'est engagée dans un processus particulier. Parce que cette crise sanitaire n'est pas qu'une crise sanitaire, elle est aussi une crise sociale et économique. Et donc, il a fallu que nous, collectivités locales, on, on s'investisse, on lance des plans, des plans d'urgence pour aider les entreprises notamment à hauteur de 30 millions d'euros, euh, qu'on lance des plans de lutte contre la précarité pour toutes les personnes qui vont souffrir de cette situation de, du Covid-19, euh, qu'on lance également un plan de relance métropolitain. Bref, quand on fait la somme de l'investissement que nous allons porter, euh, tant sur des investissements euh, publics que sur du soutien à travers des prestations sociales, que sur euh, du soutien à l'économie locale, quelles que soient les formes de soutien, allègement de taxes ou euh, apport euh, d'argent euh, auprès du euh, territoire, on est euh, sur un total de 143 millions d'euros. Ça, c'est le moment qu'il exige, parce qu'il faut en effet qu'on soit dans une politique proactive et pragmatique. Mais c'est aussi un moment, cette situation du Covid-19-2020, euh, qui est aussi un moment de la réflexion, qui doit être aussi considéré comme euh, le moment où on peut aussi, où on doit se poser collectivement la question de comment le monde doit évoluer demain. C'est pour ça que, sans clivage politique, Carole Delga, la présidente de région, et euh, Jean-Luc Boudin, le président euh, et de Toulouse Métropole et maire de Toulouse, ont décidé de lancer et de demander en réalité à un certain nombre d'experts, de spécialistes, de pouvoir nous aider à améliorer nos politiques publiques pour demain et pour engager notre territoire vers de meilleurs avenirs, je dirais. C'est pour ça qu'une commission indépendante a été créée, qui s'est appelée Toulouse Territoire d'Avenir, qui, qui a réalisé un premier rapport sous la présidence de Marion Guillou et sous le parrainage, le haut parrainage, je dirais, de Jean Tirole, avec un certain nombre d'experts, et qui ont fait des propositions, des propositions pour accroître le rayonnement scientifique de Toulouse, pour développer la stratégie d'aménagement de Toulouse pour le climat, pour contrôler, pour conforter, transformer, diversifier l'activité industrielle toulousaine, ou encore développer l'attractivité touristique. Bref, un certain nombre de pistes. 
qui vont influencer nos décisions de demain au niveau de nos collectivités. En réalité, tout ça pour vous dire que monsieur euh, le professeur, vous avez participé certes au développement et vous participez et vous participerez encore demain au développement de la recherche scientifique, mais vos travaux, à vous comme à l'ensemble des économistes, participent aussi à nous influer, à influencer quant à nos décisions économiques. Et nos décisions de politique économique, au niveau local comme au niveau national par ailleurs, doivent pouvoir s'asseoir sur des réflexions, sur des pensées, sur des euh, valeurs ajoutées intellectuelles et d'économistes pour pouvoir gagner en efficacité et gagner aussi en justice sociale. Bref, votre apport n'est pas que scientifique, il est aussi un apport pour l'intérêt général et c'est pour ça qu'en réalité je suis heureux aujourd'hui euh, de participer à cette remise de prix et de vous féliciter euh, pour toute votre contribution, qui est certes une contribution euh, scientifique, mais également une contribution d'intérêt général pour l'ensemble, euh, tout le monde en réalité, ici et ailleurs, j'allais dire. Je remercie euh, évidemment l'ensemble des participants, et en, en particulier vous, M. Jean Tirol, et vous, M. le directeur général, avec l'ensemble du personnel qui vous a beaucoup aidé et qui a permis la réalisation de cet événement. En tout cas, félicitations, M. Mathieu Jackson, pour l'ensemble de votre contribution. Un grand merci, M. Boyer, pour, pour, pour ces mots chaleureux et très inspirants. Euh, en temps, en temps normal, si on avait été tous réunis dans, dans ce, cette magnifique salle des illustres, nous aurions, nous aurions pu remettre physiquement à Matthew Jackson son prix en présence donc de, 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 Colette, de Colette Lafont. Ce prix est matérialisé, se matérialise dans, le, dans, dans une, 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 un buste d'Ariane que nous vous aurions offert, Matthew Jackson. Donc nous, nous, nous allons vous le faire passer par... Par, nous allons vous l'envoyer, comme ça vous pourrez, vous pourrez le, 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 la voir très prochainement. Et bien sûr, nous aurions aussi, avec, avec M. Monsieur, Monsieur Boyer, nous, aurions aussi, nous vous aurions aussi donné le, le chèque qui symbolise, disons, le, le, le prix Jean-Jacques Lafont qui est généreusement offert par la, par la mairie de, de, de Toulouse. Donc, encore une fois, merci beaucoup. En temps normal, on aurait aussi pu aller partager un petit moment de convivialité ensemble, mais aujourd'hui, ça ne sera pas possible. On va avoir peut-être le plaisir d'entendre de, de, les quelques mots de la part de, de Matthew Jackson. Mathieu, est-ce que vous voulez Bien sûr. Merci, merci beaucoup, et surtout à Colette Lafont et M. Boyer d'être ici et et euh, de Sébastien, Karine, Michel, de Jean, Jacques, et tout, tous les gens de, de Toulouse. Euh, C'est un grand honneur de recevoir ce prix en mémoire de Jean-Jacques Lafont. Et merci beaucoup à, à l'École d'économie de Toulouse, à la Fondation et à la Ville. En, en tant que théoricien apprenant ce, son métier dans les années 80-90, les travaux de Jean-Jacques Lafont m'ont montré à quel point des recherches approfondies pouvaient éclairer des questions d'importance pour, pour le bien-être de, de la société. Euh, les efforts de Jean-Jacques Lafont pour construire la TSE euh, dans son département d'origine et pour attirer les, les meilleurs talents du monde sont inspirants. Euh, le succès continu et, et l'influence de l'école sur la politique locale, nationale et mondiale sont un, un modèle de l'impact que peut avoir la science économique sur le monde. Euh, je suis profondément euh, ému par ce prix et, et j'attends avec impatience le moment où je pourrai de nouveau venir à Toulouse pour rendre visite à mes collègues et, et amis en, en personne et pour voir euh, la salle illustre euh, et de disputer le, le futur euh, après le, la crise sanitaire. Euh, merci à, à TSE, la Fondation, la Ville, et aussi à mes, mes parents, euh, frères et sœurs, mes filles, et, et surtout ma, ma femme, Sarah. Merci bien. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup Mathieu pour, 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 pour ces mots très, 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 très sympathiques. Et, et donc, on, on, je, comme indiqué par M. Boyer, donc, euh, 
Donc Jean Tirol, Christian Goulier, le directeur général de la, de la, de la fondation Jean-Jacques Lafont, euh, moi-même et tous les chercheurs ici seraient ravis de, que, que vous veniez nous, 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 nous voir en personne. Vous le disiez, il y a la salle des illustres à visiter. On, on pourra aussi vous amener voir d'autres fleurons de la culture et de l'art de l'art toulousain. Et il y a aussi la gastronomie toulousaine que qu'on qu aurait vraiment aimé pouvoir vous faire partager. Bon, ça sera pour une autre fois, mais on, on, on garde ça bien en tête, qu'on qui, 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 qu vous doit quand même encore quelque chose. Donc euh, voilà, on, on fera en sorte de, 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 pouvoir, de, pouvoir, de pouvoir vous accueillir comme il se doit dès, dès, dès que possible. Écoutez, je, je voudrais vous remercier encore à tous pour votre participation. Merci beaucoup, M. Boyer, de nous avoir fait le, le, le plaisir et l'honneur d'être parmi nous. Et encore une fois, félicitations à Mathieu Jackson pour l'optation de ce prix Jean-Jacques Lafont 2020. Je vous souhaite une, une bonne soirée à tous et bonne continuation et à, prenez soin de vous. À bientôt. Merci Mathieu. Merci. Merci bien. Au revoir. Au revoir. Merci. Merci, au revoir. Merci beaucoup, Matt. C'était génial. Merci beaucoup. C'était un grand plaisir. Je m'attends à être là de nouveau une fois. Enjoyez un bon café. Cassoulet and talk about the future. <laughs>